Welcome to the Football Show on PLZ Soccer's YouTube with lots to discuss from the weekend's results and looking ahead to the Scottish Cup and of course uh, we'll be discussing some of your favourite teams and the problems that they have and referees never too far away from our discussion as well. VAR, it's the three letters we dread to talk about but it's a feature of football all across the globe now. Um, thank you very much to so many of you for joining us and hitting the subscribe button as you can see uh, the figures just keep going up and up and we're absolutely delighted that you're consuming so many features that we have on our YouTube channel and downloading the app as well which has all the breaking football news. As far as the competition, we forgot to actually announce the competition winner yesterday, Ruffy, uh, of the Luka Modric uh, Champions League replica shirt. Um, so the winner is Mark Vogan from Evington. Where's that? Evington. I would say Evington's probably in the Edinburgh area. Just because <laughs> just it's what? Because it sounds <laughs> posh. <laughs> Uh, now, now, for a man like yourself, who actually, I think, were you not born in El Elgin? Born in Aberdeen, but lived in Elgin. Yeah. Right, okay, Edmonton, up in Rothshire. Whoa. So, there okay. you are. Um, not too many people live up there, but Mark Vogan does, <laughs> um, and he's the winner of the Luka Modric. So, well done to you, Mark. We should have announced it yesterday, yeah. completely and utterly ran out of time. Has Tam volunteered to present that prize? And, well, no, I think we'll... <laughs> I think, we'll, I think we'll wrap it up and post it to you, Mark. You won't get next day to deliver it, for sure. <laughs> no, absolutely. And we do have to. And I, I thought we might be able to do it at some point. Uh, tonight, roughly, after the tennis. Is that feasible? We'll maybe uh, take the uh, the Jota page yes, to the boys. Yes, that's yeah. not a problem. Yep. Great. John and Neil, get ready. We're coming to see you. Simple as that. Well done, Ruffy. That's You're a trooper. It's always not good to all. see some of the people. And we've, mm -hmm. We have actually met a few people more. Than when yeah, we I'll more. never forget that day. We had a big print. We had a massive print and we took it to uh, a winner's house. And uh, as soon as we went in, his wife obviously didn't know anything about it. And he says, oh, I'll just have that up in the living room. She went, no, you won't. <laughs> oh, he's not getting up in that living room. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's always a dilemma as far as this uh, week's competition we're giving away prizes all the way through to the summer uh, here's Kerry to give us the details this is your chance to win one of these fantastic books that looks back at the classic shirts throughout both clubs history you can read about your favourite shirt and your favourite season as a Celtic or Rangers supporter to be in with a chance of winning all you have to do is tell us which book you would like to win in the comment section below and to double your chances of winning hit the subscribe button and join us on PLZ Soccer's YouTube channel good luck yeah, not a bad competition. Uh, I mean, you do you have you kept some of the Rangers jerseys that you played in? Yeah, I've, I've probably got one from. I think I've got one from each season of my career um, for for all the teams I've played for. So, um, but kept a few of the Rangers ones, Champions League ones, Europa League ones. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, it's uh, it's a good book. Um, I think quite a lot of the strips, Ruffy, people look back on them with great affection. If it's part of your generation, or it's a player that you think of, or it's just absolutely memorable for a season that you you attended the games. Yeah, I think you just have to look at the crowds at the games. You know, there's a a, a variable, you know, selection of the, these kind of jerseys that you're talking about, and fans like to be associated with that year. Yeah, it's so easy a competition. I quite like this competition. It's my kind of competition, Ruffy. No intelligence needed. You just uh, basically in the comment section say you want the Celtic book or the Rangers book. Unless, of course, you're Brian who says, can I have both books, please? I'm greedy. <laughs> <laughs> So, there's always one that yep. stretches the competition rules, Ruffy, isn't there? Yeah, but obviously they're two great books. We had a look at them through there. They're, they're the books you want to keep a hold of. Yeah, absolutely. And the other good thing about it is not only do they have special strips that you will remember, there's also some real minging ones as well <laughs> that somebody has come up with in a design, Richard, that you think, really? Well, yeah, I mean, I suppose people are just trying to be a bit different, aren't they? Trying to give mm -hmm. the fans something that's not just your run-of-the-mill strip. Um, I know, you know, Celtic and Rangers strips are iconic, but every now and again they'll throw in a third <coughs> kit that's a, it's a bit out there. Um, Absolutely. But then I suppose it's maybe a, you know, it's one of those strips that is so bad that you want to have it. Yeah. Just for that reason. Well, that's the other thing about it. I mean, I, I'll tell you, on that point, one of the most iconic strips that people hunt, try to hunt down because it's so rare, um, but it, it, it was from the 70s, and they're so rare that <coughs> if you've got one, people will pay a fortune for it. The 
Coventry City away strip from the 70s, which was a brown strip, it was absolutely terrible. I mean, I don't know anybody that would have a brown uh, strip, Ruffy, but it was a, a brown Coventry. Do you remember those? It had the kind of a um, arrow, you know, the stripes, just they went at an angle from the top of the I show. Do you not remember it? No. Um, I think Ian Wallace used to play for Coventry right. City. You'll remember Ian. Ian, yeah. Um, so brown Coventry strip was right up there. It doesn't as, sound great. No, it doesn't sound mm-hmm. great, but if you have one, uh, I think somebody would play it. A, a good few hundred quid for it to be honest with you um, what about the quiz question I always like <coughs> to test you guys so here's the question you can give me your guess now how many English Premier League managers have been sacked this season uh, so you want to give us a guess give us a figure um, I want to say six six roughy four F- just four just four okay there you are uh, Ruffy's giving us his guess what do you think we'll give you the answer at the end of the <laughs> the uh, the show um, that's an easy quiz question the competition will play that again for you so you can enter um, but how many English Premier League managers have been sacked this season okay from the Premiership <laughs> results at the uh, weekend again if anything it's the status quo at the top end of the table Richard but you know at the bottom end there's more than a few clubs uh, who are starting to really worry how they get out of it. Here's the table uh, to give you a little indication of how tight it is. Motherwell, Dundee United there, Ross County, not out of it. Uh, and I'm sure you can say the same of Kilmarnock and, and all it takes is a couple of results and St Johnson could be dragged in there. Yeah, I mean, obviously I've got a, a natural bias towards St Johnson. Um, played there like Callum a lot. Um, but I just think I, when I watch them and they've had a couple of difficult, difficult games against the Old Farm and they've been... You know they've kept in the game, and both, I know they, they get beat four one then by Celtic, but Celtic can do that to anyone on their day. Um, and I just feel that St Johnston have certainly got enough. You know they've, they've got Nicky Clark, uh, Stevie May, Zach Wooden now. Score, they'll all score goals, and I think that's a, the biggest thing when you're down at that <laughs> bottom end of the table. Obviously these teams always concede too many goals, but the teams that have a goal scorer that always gives them a little bit extra on the other teams around them. So I think St Johnston will be fine. Um, I, I, I will really worry for Motherwell. Um, I watched them. Um, you know, most of their game and I just they were so easy to play against. I mean and and, and credit to Aberdeen, of course they've been on a, a horrific run, but at least they showed some kind of fight. But you know, if you if if there was a time to play Aberdeen it was it was at the weekend and, and Motherwell just never turned up and so easy to play play against. Um, they concede such poor goals, soft goals. Um, and they're the one team I really, you know, I really fear for because they seem to be just be getting worse week on week. Yeah. Um I mean we've talked about Motherwell I I, I uh, was at Fir Park in midweek to watch them against St Johnson. I agree with you on St Johnson. I think they've got enough that you could see from the way they were playing football. I thought they played some really good football against Celtic in patches, you know, especially with their delivery into the box. Um, but Motherwell, I'm worried about. Kilmarnock, I think, with that whole debacle with Kyle Lafferty is a problem as well for them, Ruffy. Yeah, the, the Motherwell one, they, they're just not defending properly. Uh, they don't have proper defenders in there, which is strange because Motherwell used to have you know, two big centre-halves who just went about their business and just did uh, their best and played to their ability. But some of the goals are losing are poor. You know. I think, to be fair, I think they must have had injuries because they finished the game with yeah. no centre-backs on the pitch. Yeah, Motherwell. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, I mean, to be fair to, to Stephen Hamill, and this is... This is not an old pal, Zach. It's just exactly what he's stating in the press conference. In midweek, he says, you know, we've got near enough a full team out injured, you know, that would be, you know, quite a number of them would be starters. Well, that's it. like I said, they finished the game with, with <coughs> I think it was three fullbacks or four full and a midfielder across the back line. So it's, it's never, it's never, you know, it's never a good time to lose players, but certainly right now when the, the confidence is low anyway, you need to have two, like as Bruffy says, you need to have two guys in the middle of the pitch who are going to just battle and fight for everything. And it's difficult getting fullbacks to come into the middle of the pitch, <coughs> but it's, you know, it's a different skill set. Um, but th- these guys are going to have to step up, otherwise they're, they're only going one way. Yeah, and the you know, banners outside the stadium, never good to see that. And I don't think any fans, never mind Motherwell fans, are cutting a manager slack even if he's got injuries. If the results keep going the same way, you know, they just start to lose patience. I would give the manager a wee bit of slack when there's that amount of injuries. I mean, if it's your first team players, you're going to struggle. You're not going to be playing the football you would be if they were playing. So you've got to give him a bit of slack and then if he gets three or four or maybe five back and the results continue to do that that way, then you've got to have a look at it. But as it is just now, uh, said you, you could take any team in the Premier League and take ten players out of their first team, and they would struggle. 
I, I think the big worry for any Premier League manager, Ruffy, is if you actually cut them some slack and buy them some time because over the last year, any time you've said that stick by the manager, <laughs> he's usually sacked within four uh, or five we'll days finished, of you. Yeah. <laughs> so, I don't think he's there yet. No. You know, he's got a massive Scottish Cup game up at Wraith Rovers. You know, that's got to be a win. You know, and we, I think we've talked about the fixtures he's got after that. But it doesn't matter who's playing, they've got to win a game. If you win a game, it takes the pressure off. The supporters relax a wee bit. They think, well, maybe maybe we're being a wee bit hasty here. But it's all about winning winning games. Well, Niall's a big Motherwell fan. He says, I'm worried for Motherwell, lads. I hope we get out of it. If we don't beat Wraith in the Scottish Cup on Saturday, I think the pressure's going to build on Hamill. Yep, um, I don't disagree with you there. Niall, one of the other issues from the weekend, of course... Got to say that you, Ruffy and Alison, you know, called it correctly as far as the McCrory one. They're still, Tam and I are still in the camp. If you're giving red cards for an elbow like that, the game's up. But another VAR is Dundee United are appealing the Ryan Edwards uh, red card. Do you think they've got any grounds? Do you think they've got any chance of winning it? I I, I can't see how they possibly could. <coughs> I thought it was a red card at the time. Sorry, initially when I seen it, I thought. You know, fair enough challenge, a hard challenge. But then when you see it back, um, you know, he goes in with far too much force. He doesn't need to go in with that much force. I think he's, I don't think he's trying to hurt Halliday, but it's one of those where it's, you know, he ball man, everything, you know, the kind of old school yeah. tackle. But he follows through and he catches him high in the shin, kind of rakes down right onto his foot. Um, I just, I cannot for the life of me see how that would, would win an appeal. Yeah, um, if it wins an appeal, then the follow through is okay. Well, yeah, it says a dangerous yeah. precedent. Yeah. yeah, if he wins the appeal, the referees will be scratching their head going, you know, what's the point? You know, me, me making decisions on the, the day, you know, that's what they're there for. They're there to to keep control of the game. And, and that, I mean, I'm, I'm the same, you know, I thought it was just a really old school hard, you know, to win the ball. But I mean, they, when you see it two or three times, it gets worse. It doesn't get better, yeah. you know, and, and the more you see it, so I wouldn't think that'd be overturned. OK, um, there's also some dilemmas. Um, we'll talk about Dundee United <laughs> shortly and their predicament trying to get out of it. Um, I, I mean, it's a situation where I think Tony Asgar uh, is under a, a bit of pressure um, and a lot of people are looking and thinking, what's gone wrong? Um, this is what he had to say, Tony, about the situation at Dundee United. Nobody is more unhappy about uh, how we came out of the window than myself. One of the big things was, why did we let a striker go out on loan when we didn't replace him? The reality is, if a player's here and he's not getting game time, then we have to make a conscious decision for the good of the group. Uh, we were still looking to try and bring players in. Unfortunately, we hit the bar with a few, but I think if you look around at any club in Scotland, trying to get a striker in all during the window has been uh, very difficult. Um, so... Uh, that's just one player, and I don't think you know the departure of Tony Watt is suddenly where the crisis has emerged. It's, it's. I mean, I can remember being up at Tannadice watching Dundee United perform so well against AZ Altmar, and then after that seven nil drubbing, the wheels has come off. It's just come off. Yeah, it's. I mean, th those kind of defeats are, are difficult to bounce back from. You need to rely on your experienced players in the squad to kind of galvanise the group. You need to rely on the management team, but obviously that's kind of changed since then. Um, and it's just, it's it's been a real difficult run for them. But it's. I think the the, the frustrations from the Dundee United supporters seems to be, you know, it's kind of three pronged. It's it's Tony Ashgar, it's at the players, it's at the manager. And I think there's. There's something just not clicking at the moment. I believe that the manager is obviously not quite getting the best out of his players. I don't think they are performing at a high enough level for him. Um, whether that's formation or not having the correct players that he wants, I don't know. But they're certainly not performing on the pitch. You know, but when you when you're losing a striker, you know, Tony, I don't think he played that many games. No, he hadn't started that many recently. He was out of favour. Yeah, but when you you know if you're in a squad and you think right, well, we've lost a striker, we're not getting one in. We've got, now we've got one main striker. We've got a couple of younger kids who, you know, in a relegation battle, it's not really fair to throw them in. Um, it kind of seeps into the squad, and you start to think, how are we getting out of this? Where are we scoring goals? Um, so then that does filter into the players, and they're playing with such a lack of confidence at times. I think they're okay in games for large spells, and they actually do play some really good football. But defensively, they're so weak; they concede far too many goals far too easily. Um, and it's just when you look at all the teams down there, I actually think Dundee United will. I think <laughs> they will be one of the two at the bottom. I think the other two. I think I think Kilmarnock and um, Ross County. Ross County will scrape out of it. But I think Motherwell and Dundee United could be the two based on current form, 
yeah. um, but with the squad they've got, the size of squad, the budget they've got, they shouldn't be there. But how many times have you heard a team who are, oh, no one's too good to be relegated? Yeah. Um, and they certainly fall in that character, car, uh, category because they've got some great players, very good technical players, but they don't have many defensive players. Four losses, one draw out of the last five league games, Ruffy. Um, you know, the season is not looking good. Won five, drawn five, lost 14. They've got a goal difference of minus 17 with only 20 points. They're mm -hmm. in the mire. Of the four teams down there, certainly they've got the biggest budget. So that tells you there's a couple of things that I'll throw at you that I think, you know, wrong. I, I agree with you with the, the back line that can't keep, you know, the goals going in, can't stop them from going in. But I think... The other things that have gone against them is quite simply there are a lot of players are underperforming. They're, they're getting paid quite a substantial amount of money and they're not stepping up to the plate. That's one. I do think they've given the job to an inexperienced manager who's just, it's just too early to take on such a huge job um, as Dundee United. I think he's, I think he's found wanting at the moment. Um, and unless they suddenly start playing for him, then I think they could be in, in trouble with it. As far as, I mean, I picked... Kilmarnock and Motherwell uh, on the basis that you need goal scorers and sh you know but if, if Dundee United were to lose Stephen Fletcher there's not many options up front for them no I, I don't, I don't even he's not prolific I, I don't agree with his, uh, the statement he's put there uh, Tony Watt left and didn't leave as much time to get a striker any, any good director of football or any good manager will have had uh, that in the back burner you've got two months before the window comes you should a good manager should have a list of his wish list and expect something like that happening. Mm. You still, I believe you still can get players in on yeah. loan up until the end of the month. So I would like to think that they are actively trying to do something about it. But uh, it just looks like bad management to me. And uh, we spoke about it numerous times about teams who are down the bottom. If you've not got leaders on the park, and I know they've got Jalen McGrew there, but he should be you know, leading for the, for the front. But uh, I don't think they've got enough. They've got good players, they've got good technical players, you know, the boy McGrath, they've got Levitt in there, and I think they're good players, but I think Richard touched on it defensively. You hear every manager coming in after the game and saying, we've got a clean sheet today. Didn't play particularly well, but we've got a clean sheet. Yeah. They can't get clean sheets, you know, and if you keep getting into games knowing at some stage in the 90 minutes you're going to concede, it's not a good good way to go forward. Yeah. Especially when you don't score that many. You know, I've been in squads that before and you're thinking that we need to score the first goal, otherwise we've lost the game. Um, and that just, it's not a good place to be in because you, your confidence just ebbs away. And as soon as the other team score a goal, you're thinking, well, that's it. We're, we could play all day and we're never going to score. And, and where, where do you go from here? So they need something to, to kind of flip for them and, and pretty quick. But I think, you know, you, to be fairness to, to Liam Fox, he's, he's just, you know, he's 37. You know, in, in tough moments, you know, as tough moments as a player, I would rely on my experience as he would have. But he's, he doesn't have the experience. He doesn't have the anyone experience beside him. Um, so I think it's it's unfair to label all at the manager. Certainly, I think the players of most of the teams down at the bottom, the players need to have a look at themselves and go, guys, we are not performing well enough. Yeah, and if Stephen Fletcher <laughs> uh, doesn't score goals, he's revealed his uh, son gets stick at school. Oh, they do. I they do. He's on this penalty. Uh, it's, it's a hard one. My wee, I didn't see my wee boy after the game because he was in bed. He came back from school the next day. He's like, I feel sorry for you. I said, Don't feel sorry for me. I'm, <laughs> I'm alright, don't worry. I think he'd get more stick in school and I did. <laughs> <laughs> Just shows you how it can affect everybody, Ruffy, doesn't it? I mean, every, you know, players take a lot of criticism, but when your family's taking it that's, as well. That's what some supporters don't realise, that football players are family people. You know, they've got to go home and have food and see their kids and deal with the, the, the things that happen in, in a married life, you know, and it, it, it can affect the family, it can affect your wife, it can affect your kids, obviously the kids are at school. Uh, you've got to try and keep that away for them, you know, uh, if you can. But it is quite a hard shift when, when things aren't going particularly well. Yeah, and of course the manager himself, he'll be getting a bit of stick, but he's still confident he can get United out of the trouble. But I've said this numerous times, and you're probably bored of me saying this, but I believe in the group, I believe in... I think we've seen uh, an upturn in performances. We've had two poor results this week. We've had a tough week. We've had three defeats in a week. But I'm even more determined now, having gone through today that we're, we're going to get to where we need to get to. Not with, not with. Mm, uh, okay. Who's your two at the bottom then? Motherwell and Dundee United. Motherwell and Dundee United. Which way round I'm not 
You're not I, committing. I'm not committing yet. I mean, at the start of the season, I, I said St Mirren would be down the bottom, so <laughs> that's what I know. I don't, don't worry about getting things wrong. That's part and parcel of the, of the joy of it all. I mean, I, I actually, you know, I watched uh, Motherwell at the start of the season and thought, well, they don't look good. But then St Johnston had a terrible start, and then you thought they're going. And then, you know, a, a January transfer window can and transform everything, you know, top and bottom uh, for certain clubs. And every manager has kind of, apart from, um, well, Giovanni Van Bronckhorst obviously lost his job. Um, Ange Postecoglou is rock solid in his job, but every other manager you've been looking at and thinking they've, they've had a wee lull where people have started asking questions, you know? Oh, you could look at every every team manager, apart from the Rangers and Celtic, every manager has been under pressure. Yeah. Every manager has been a couple well, of games away from getting sacked. You could put Rangers in there as well, Robbie, because no, the, the, the manager got sacked. Yeah, but after that, after yeah. he came in, since then, you know, you look at every manager and we sit here on a Friday and we're talking about the games and he's going, he's got to get a result today. Yeah. Uh, they, these two managers need to get a result today. They need to get a result. And that's what happens when you're down there and, and if... It, if most of them don't go on, I'm saying a run, I just mean two wins. Yeah. When it comes to the split, it's up in the air. It's really up in the air. It doesn't matter who you are, Dundee United, because as I said the other day there, there's nobody tailed off. There's nobody distant. There's nobody, well, they're, they're gone. We don't have to worry about them. They're gone. We just have to stay at that playoff place. That's not the case now. There is one other manager who's not had that labelled at him this year, and I, and I have to mention that this, well, this season, is because David Martindale's performance as his Livingston manager is embarrassing everyone and increasing the pressure on the other managers because his budget is easily the lowest in the league. Yeah, I would say him and Robbie Nielsen as well. I don't think Robbie's been under pressure, yeah. although he does get some stick and for, for, for yeah, when, they, when they lose one game. But um, no, David Martindale, I mean, I've, I've spoke, to, I spoke about him uh, a few times. He's just... He knows how to get the best out of a group. You know, he signs players that fit into the, to, to his management style. Um, you know, the, the, we done a pack on him at the weekend. How hard they all work. You know, Nubles in the, in the team as a left winger, and he's backtracking in front of his his back four, winning the ball. Um, and, and and that's what uh, Martindale demands of them. And it's actually quite a sad. <laughs> I think it's a sad indictment of the players in, in Scotland at the moment that that highlighting the fact that a team like Livingston works so hard. Is we're, we're, we're talking about that as if oh that's great that should be what every team do bare minimum you know with the players especially players out with Livingston because of the money they're getting paid you know they should be working hard as a bare minimum yeah. um, but but Livingston outwork most teams they've got quality when they play um, they can go long they can go direct they can actually play the ball around they've got good quality from the wide areas D Nicky Devlin um, you know Livingston fans won't thank me for saying it but I can't uh, I don't know why he's not a, a bigger team. Yeah. Um, and I use that in inverted commas because, you know, they're fourth in the league at the moment. But um, I think he's real good quality. Um, and they've got some, you know, the midfield two, Sean Kelly, Stephen Kelly, are really forming a decent partnership. And right now, they're, they're you know, they should be looking to, to push and catch hearts because... And Bruce Anderson looks revitalised. Bruce Anderson, I mean, the movement for his, I think it was their second goal at the weekend is brilliant. You know, kind of in behind the defender. The defender doesn't know where he is. Um, not great defending, but fantastic movement. And I just think you're right. I just think they're embarrassing all the other teams. Um, but they just they work hard and they, they, they look like they fight for each other. Um, and obviously they respond to the way the manager talks. Yeah, I like Des Halliday's uh, mentioned here, and r rightly so. He mentions also that maybe not under pressure, but certainly people were looking at, at a little point in the season. Stephen Robinson has convinced everyone at uh, St Mirren, especially what's going on in the background and what he's doing to try and, mm -hmm. you know, put his own ideas in <coughs> to the club. He's come in. There was a little blip where I, I, I think they were, uh, as I looked at it, they were one win in nine before they got that penalty kick win over Dundee in the cup. But there was a lot of draws in. There was only four defeats, Ruffy. And people were starting to say, oh, you know, they need to get it together again. And then they just seemed to kick in and managed to get three wins consecutively. But, but he, he's done what Richard's saying. He, he saw the bad he saw the bad run that they've had and says, I need to change this. 
I need to change what, what the way I'm playing. I need to be harder to beat. Yeah. He set his team up to fight and battle, and and that's that's why they got the success because that's the, the team they were, and then they became the team they don't want to play against. Because if you're going to take in and against them, you've got to work really hard, and they're just built on that. And, and they, with the confidence of winning games and no losing, it's just got better and better. And, and a lot of players have stepped up to the plate. I, I think the, the boy O'Hara. Uh, who was at Motherwell? He's had a su superb season. Really? Uh, really, really good. Really, really good. OK, um, that's the bottom end. Top end, of course, every time a manager gets sacked down south, Ange Postecoglou's name comes up um, as possibly uh, a target. Here's how the uh, the running and uh, riding looks at uh, Leeds United at the moment. Uh, as far as the next manager, Carlos Caberon, 5-4. Uh, Andoni Araola at 7-4, uh, Marcelo Bielsa, surely they're not going to bring back th their old manager at 5-1, uh, Maurizio Pochettino 8-1, Ange Postacoglu 12-1, Ralph Hasenhutl at 12-1, um, I think the book is just throw names out and see, can we get a wee tenor here? <laughs> <laughs> I mean Ange Postacoglu, um, no disrespect to Leeds United who in the past, have been a really huge club in English football. They're not there now. They're desperately trying to stay in the division. Ange Postecoglou is not leaving Celtic in the next year for Leeds United. Well, I mean, I've, I've spoken about this numerous times, and the only answer is money. Um, why why players leave the old firm to go down and, and manage teams that are not at the top end of the prim Premiership, and it, it can only be money. I mean, there's people can argue you want to test yourself at the highest level. Yes, there is that, especially for managers. But Ange Postecoglou, he looks like he's going to win the league. You've got other trophies, two other trophies to play for. You'll be in the Champions League. You know, you with all respect, you won't get that at Leeds. You know, and and you know they're not where they used to be. Um, why would you leave a team who are so successful, are playing really well, who are getting better week on week, adopting the style that you've brought in, to go and then have to start all over again with Leeds United? Um, who you then you're, you're taking over a team who are clearly not doing well that's why the manager's left and then you need to start again and rebuild that I just I don't see it happening um, I think the success that, that Ange has had at Celtic I think he deserves a bigger team than Leeds if you're yeah. down to England I know people will, will shoot me down because it's only the Scottish Premiership but I think that the, the, how well he's performed up here he shouldn't leave at he shouldn't, in my opinion, leave Celtic for a Leeds United. He should wait until it's a bigger team, um, a team that's pushing the top end of the league. Because <coughs> why would you leave the Champions League football for, you know, mid-table mediocrity in England? Yeah, uh, there are a number of elements, Ruffy, that, that I would say would go against him even contemplating a job. Obviously, you know, Richard has mentioned that there's money involved. I think there are certain clubs, even with money involved, that he won't bite at. Leeds United being one, even if they offered him, you know, a huge amount of money. Um, that's the one element of it. You cannot suggest for a minute that, you know, the English Premier League will have chairmen and chief executives and owners who um, maybe are not convinced because the amount of times they've actually given somebody, a rookie, a job in charge of a huge business that you think, how the hell did he get that job? So I would discount that as a reason. I think that the main stumbling block here is for some mm. of the sensible chairmen at the top end of the Premier League, I think they're looking and saying, well, wait a minute. He's winning the league in a division which has got a poor standard. He's winning it against a Rangers side who are trying to get themselves stabilised again. I think if Ange Postecoglou wins the league and suddenly in that group stage of the Champions League gets them to the knockout, I think suddenly then the bells start ringing and people start saying, wait a minute, look at the football they played, because they did get a lot of credit last season for the football they played, uh, you know, from August to um, October, November in the Champions League. I thought, you know, Real Madrid, Celtic fans were happy the way they played at home. It's against the European champions, end up losing. You know, they've played some really good football against Leipzig as well. They've played some really good football, got a bit of credit, maybe not the points they were looking for, but I, I think if they got from group stage to a knockout stage, a lot of English German and owners might look and say, right, now you might be ready. And the last point, Ruffy, <laughs> I think Ange Postecoglou is saying, no, I've got a job to do here, and here's the goals that I want to do here, I'm happy. Yeah, I think it was Martin O'Neill or, or Neil Lennon that said when you're at Rangers or Celtic, four years is a good lifespan and if you're doing particularly well you might look somewhere else but you've got to start saying to yourself if it's a premiership 
what well, even though we get in the group group stages of the Champions League, do you honestly think you get a manager in the top six in the Premiership in England? What right now? No, if we go into the group stages with Celtic. Well, he's in the group stages, but I'm saying if no, they if they qualify, if they got the knockout, no, do you stage. think he get an Arsenal, a Man City, a Man United, a Chelsea, a Tottenham? Uh, well, I, I don't think his CV's there for well, that. Even getting into the qualifying the stages. Sh- the strange sort of thing about it sometimes, Ruffy, is sometimes, sometimes it's about timing, and I don't think I don't think his stock is at the highest level for the top clubs to bite at him right now. But if he suddenly pulled them out of the group stages with a good group of teams in there that's a good standard and then suddenly he's playing the certain football and taking it on from last season or sorry last year when they were playing in the group stages if he manages to take that on again and then suddenly Richard he gets them to a knockout phase that's when people start to look and say okay you're playing against a good standard and your your style of football is something that we want there is it a top six as Ruffy says I don't know you know is it a Liverpool I I I don't think I just think the top six teams in Premiership they go for winners. They go for somebody who's not. Well, just, that's not a who's good. No, I know, but they don't go for people who's just not playing in the, the Champions League or playing. It. They go for pe- managers who've won the Europa, who've won the Champions League, who've won the top Chelsea trophies. Chelsea managers Graham Potter. Yeah, yeah well, what's there, he there, there are objections. There, there are certain Exceptions. people, but I yeah. would say the top ones, the really ones, the Man Cities, the Man Uniteds. They go for the, the cream of Europe who have done something, whether it's their league or whatever. Yeah, but the problem with that is, quite simply, it's not an exact science, it's not a, a definitive on that, because quite simply, you know, there's people talking about Jurgen Klopp could be sacked. I don't see it. Um, you know, is that an Ange Postecoglou job one year, two year down the line? Who knows? Um, they might go for someone else. Um, if Ange Postecoglou continues in this vein, you know, it's... Some of the top owners have made some ridiculous decisions. I mean, Frank Lampard moved from Derby County to one of the biggest jobs in the country. In the end, couldn't hack it. Then he gets a, a an Everton job, can't turn them around, you know. So I, th- I think you know the way people look at Scottish football has an impact on on whether they get top jobs. I agree with Ruffy to a certain extent that. Um, are the are the, the the big six, the top six, going to be looking at Ange Postecoglou? Probably not for all the reasons that Ruffy mentioned. Should they be? Well, why not? You know, if the, the way he plays at Celtic, um, the players down in England are more suited to that because they're quicker, they're stronger, they're technically better. That's all the kind of things he needs. He needs two quick centre halves. England is littered with quick centre halves. Uh, technicians on the ball, they've got loads down there. So the way he, he plays and sets up the game would suit, you know, the, the teams down in England. I think it would probably suit the. the the top teams maybe more than the relegation battling teams, but I just think if you're at a club like Celtic and you are winning leagues and cups, for me as a manager or a player, you want to win things, you want to be successful. And t- to me, success is Celtic winning the league. And who cares if they're winning the league every year against teams that are you know miles behind them? Um, they're winning, they're winning a trophy. Whereas to me, success is not going down to 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 Leeds, to Brighton, with all respect to these teams, to Norwich, and going. Oh, you remember the time we finished ninth? Yeah. No, no player does. But you remember the time you won the cup? Yes, I do. So that's that's that to me is success. But you know that's just me personally. Ange might go. You know what? I want a crack at the the Premiership. I want to see if my style works down there, and fair play to him. But I think it'll. I think you're right. I think it'll take a bigger draw than Leeds United, with all respect to them, to to pull him away from Celtic. Yeah. Um, but who knows? Um, who knows where he wants to go? But I think f- right now, I think he's probably happy at Celtic. I think I think he thinks he needs to prove himself. With the experience of what he's had there in Europe, he wants to take that challenge on. Yeah, he that's wants what to I think. prove to everybody that okay, I've learned a lot by, by the results that we've had. I've slightly, I've added players that are better than what they were. Let's see what I can do when I get into the Champions League, you know, and let's compete against the big teams again, and then that'll make his stock go higher. Yeah, well, James shares uh, that opinion. Scottish football needs to get back to winning games in Europe and getting into group stages before anyone will look towards uh, any manager in Scotland. And I must not, don't disagree with that. Um, I think our standard is is not great. Um, but, of course, the big two are leaving everybody in... Uh, they're really leaving everybody in the slipstream now. And I think that, that gap is 
is getting ever wider. I mean, the Hearts are doing their absolute best, but even their absolute best is, what, 19, 20 points off at times? Yeah, and, you know, I think that the game recently between Hearts and Rangers was the, the one time where you, or one of the times you thought, you know, Hearts could go and do something here, um, and, and Rangers put them to the sword. You know, they were excellent right from the start of the game. I think they probably surprised Hearts how they started the game, because under Michael Beale, they've tended to start quite slowly. Um, but, yeah, they were... They were Far better than Hearts on the night, but you know, Hearts players came out, the management came out and said, "That's that's what we need to try and achieve. We need to get to that level." Um, and and the problem you've got is, you know, someone like Robin Nielsen is a very successful manager, very good manager. He's been given the time to now build up his Hearts team to be the third force in Scotland by far and away. I know Livingston could push them, and I still think Hearts will come out on top. You know, Dave mm -hmm. Martindale has had time at Livingston. We're so quick to to get rid of managers that. They don't have time to, to build any kind of force because they leave so quickly. Then they have a turnaround, and there's all you know. There's players from three or four different managers, so it's it's difficult. But at the end of the day, when when guys are putting money, when owners are putting money into clubs, and their team are risking relegation, and they feel that the manager has to go, then you know that's their prerogative. But I think if you want to build anything at any team, managers need to have time. Um, and they don't typically get that unless they get instant success. Yeah, uh, so we don't see Ange Postecoglou uh, being realistically in the running uh, for the Leeds United job or indeed even contemplating taking it. What do you think on that one? Um, thank you for joining us and offering your opinion. Don't forget, if you are offering your opinion in our uh, feed on the YouTube channel, uh, then by all means, try and keep it sensible and uh, any profanities. Obviously, we have people monitoring it, not religiously non-stop because uh, you do your boxing if you were trying to police um, some people whose language is choice, but we try and keep it decent and lots of people who follow us on our programming um, are thoroughly decent football fans who love the game, so thank you for subscribing as well. If you get a chance, share it with your friends, tell them where we are on YouTube. If you download the app, you can actually watch the program live on your phone or your tablet or indeed on your PC and there's the website and all the breaking football news as well. So there's so much more than the football show on offer and it's absolutely free uh, for you to watch. There's uh, uh, there's no licence fee. Just, uh, just <laughs> let's throw that in there, Ruffy. Is that fair? <laughs> We've been at it 10 years. We've, we've got to use every trick in yeah. the book, Ruffy. Um, talking of which, um, we always look to uh, managers and analyse their decisions and their conundrums and all the problems that they have on a day-to-day -day basis and we like to offer opinion and love to hear your opinion on it. Rangers get a, a win at the weekend um, over Ross County, albeit it was a struggle. I've spoke to a number of uh, Rangers uh, fans who said it wasn't pretty to watch. Um, some people may be questioning, you know, John McLaughlin coming under a bit of criticism for Jordan White's goal. Um, did you see it that way? Yeah, I mean, he, he, he missed judges the flight of the ball, and he's coming out to he's coming out to punch it, and he just gets it all wrong. Jordan White nips in front of him and heads into an empty net. I think we've seen that against Kilmarnock. He done it. I think he done it once before they scored, and then he done it for the goal at Kilmarnock as well. Um, and this on the back of Michael Be Beale saying that he played in one of the games because he's better at coming for crosses. So it's almost like he's, he's you know he's, he's kind of set the keeper up to fail, but. I don't know any goalkeeper, and you know, Ruff is better to speak to this, that would like not knowing if they're playing every week. Now, if you're the number one goalkeeper, then you're the number one. And unless you are injured or make any mistakes, or you're getting rotated for a cup game maybe, typically you start every game. So this Alan McGregor, you know, him needing a rest, that, I don't think that argument will wash. Yeah. You know, I've, I've played with Alan and um, I can't see him being happy at this constant rotation. Um, but you know, it's, it's maybe the, that's the way Michael Beale sees it going. Um, who am I to, to, to judge him? He's, he's not lost a game since he came in charge. But I think it puts a bit of pressure on the goalkeeper constantly coming in that he's going to have to have a good game because otherwise, if he makes one mistake, we're all talking about it. Yeah, and the manager is being asked a question. You know, I think we've done probably about 40 training sessions and Robbie's been involved in 10 or 12. So that's really hard for Robbie to be able to show what he can do now. But John's been there. Uh, all the time as a mainstay. We obviously know Alan is not getting any younger, but he's clearly our number one right now. But if I feel that um, he needs to have a rest, and I think John's always been able. Have we lost any games with John? So John's not the issue when he's in the goals. Oh. Hmm, an interesting take from the manager there. Uh, you know, 
I thought Ro uh, Richard was just about to say, you know, I've got to ask you, Rafi, about the experience uh, of coming for cross uh -huh. balls. And I thought, Richard, calm yourself. No, you never, no, never no, came no. for a cross ball. But what do you make of this? Well, no, Richard must have been the goalkeeper at some stage because everything he said there is 100%. If you're a goalkeeper, you want to play every week. Yeah. You know, and if you don't play it, and Richard's touched on it again, if you leave me out for five weeks and say, right, you're in the day, my confidence is all over the place. I'm not playing. I'm not playing week in, week out. I might be training and I might look good in training. But I'm not getting a match experience, you know. And now, now you're throwing me in, and I've got. I, I know deep down that you're you're testing me. You no, know, you're trying to make your mind up whether I'm going to be a number one. So that's another added pressure that's on you. Well, do you I think John McLaughlin is a future no, I don't, number one? No, I don't. I, I think I think uh, with the standard that Rangers want to be at, uh, the manager wants to be at. They want to be in Europe as well, playing against the big teams. And we've seen Alan McGregor uh, is a big big match player, he makes the big saves, he makes the important saves. John McLaughlin will make saves, there's no doubt about that, he's a quality goalkeeper. But if you're at Rangers, you, you, you want a right number one who wins G games, because you're not under pressure that often, but you're going to be called upon to win the game for your team. And Alan McGregor's been doing that for years and years. I, I don't understand the resting bit, unless Alan's carrying some wee injuries and knees, or, and he's maybe saying, you know, I'm no 100%, I would leave him out. But if this is Alan's last season, I'd want to play in every game. Yeah, well, I'd, I'd want to leave the club. Everybody, the, the players saying, look, I've been here, I'm playing when I'm 40, I'm giving my everything for the team, and then I'll leave. You know, and you don't want you don't want to leave the club, and the fans are going, "Oh, he only played fifty percent of the games." You're blah blah blah, whatever, because that's what the fans are like. Yeah. So, no, if I was Alan, I'd want to be playing every week. Yeah. Here are the stats from the three goalkeepers. Um, obviously, uh, Alan McGregor uh, conceded thirty-three goals, matches played twenty-three, clean sheets seven, so uh, minutes in the goal sixty-three point six. Uh, McLaughlin played sixteen, conceded eighteen, clean sheets eight and uh, minutes per goal 80 and really Robbie McCrory nobody can make any uh, real decision on him yet because he's he, he's yet to really state his case Richard yeah you know you heard the manager there <coughs> the four training sessions they've had he's only been involved in a quarter of them um, I don't know, don't know whether that's injury or whether it's he's just not been involved but it would be very difficult as Ruffy was saying to throw him in um, because you know, you're you're one mistake away from getting kind of uh, criticism from fans, from pundits, from from the rest of your team. So you, you need to you need to have your eye in now. Will he go on to get his chance? You certainly hope so. Yeah. And um, but it need it would probably need to be in a you know in a a start of a cup campaign where they're playing kind of lower league opposition with all respect. Or but the big call for Michael Beal is cup games coming up with those two keepers because. He's got the time where Rangers fans are hoping that Celtic will slip up, but they, you're realistic at looking and saying, can't see it. So it's the cup games where he's got to make the big call and hope that that call does not involve a mistake which costs him the cup. Yeah, and, and, and for me, again, who am I to, to question him, but for me, you're more likely to get a mistake if your keepers are in and out. And they're in and out because despite Alan McGregor, you know, he's far and away the best goalkeeper I've ever worked with. But you're right, you, you need to be playing, especially at the critical level of goalies, you need to be playing every week to get your eye in, to get your timing right. Um, McLaughlin, I, I do feel for him because, as Ruffy said, he's coming in every so often and expecting to be as good as McGregor, which he won't be for three, four, five games. So it's it's a it's a big call, and you would you would hope. I know sometimes managers rotate goalkeepers for cup competitions, but at least then they know it's coming and they can start to mentally prepare. But we're, the kind of unknown, I would imagine, is the worst thing for these two goalies because it's you know they don't know game to game who's going to be playing. Um, and I what think would you do if you were if between now and the end of the season? Would you be saying, right, McGregor, it's you, and then I know I'm going to have to go and buy a goalkeeper. I think, yeah, because I think if, with all respect to McLaughlin, he's, he's not a young lad. He's not, you know, he's he's not going to come in and be your number one for the next ten years. Yeah. Um, so he's kind of in an unfortunate situation. He's behind one of Rangers' best ever, if not best goalkeeper. Um, but for me, I, again, I'm probably slightly biased here, but I think McGregor's the number one. I think he's the best goalkeeper. I think he, as Ruffy said, I think he's a goalkeeper that wins you games. Now McLaughlin does make saves, and he is a very good goalkeeper. But I think McGregor tends to make the big saves at the right moment, um, and he's certainly won Rangers so many games and, and so many points. So I, I would play him till the end of the season, and then probably look to replace 
you know, if, if Fallon's not going to be there and, and John's, I think they need at least one goalkeeper to, f to fight for the number one slot, but it has to be someone, as Ruffy said, of stature. Yeah, OK. Um, this is the Football Show. Mm. Thank you very much for following us. Give us your thoughts on uh, the Rangers' goalkeeping situation. McGregor all the way to the end, or um, is he just tinkering with it when he's got a bit of time in some of the games, especially at Ibrox, to throw John McLaughlin in as well? Is it a good thing? Um, give us your thoughts on that. Uh, there's one story bubbling along at the moment, Ruffy, which is gathering pace. When you have, uh, you know, a, a financial regulator looking at Manchester City and suddenly saying that there are, you know, more than a few charges labelled against them, this club looks as if it's got a lot of explaining to do. Yeah, the, the thing that amazes me is how long as they've taken to get there. I mean, I think it finished in 20, 2018. You know, what have they been doing for the last five years? You know, I know obviously... Paid if you lawyers. Yeah, exactly. So, and they're not the only team that's doing it. I mean, some of the, the, the figures that are banded about players coming to clubs and getting 300,000 a week and 400,000 a week, you, you have... I'd love to. I'd love to know how they balance the books. I'd love to see them. You know how with the crowds they get in. A lot of them don't get massive crowds. You know, so it'd be really interesting the way they do it. But I mean, if they've got good people looking after their books, I'm sure they'll think that they can talk their way out of this one. Well, listen, whether it's Man City or anyone else, everybody has basically been laughing at the way the clubs have worked out through loopholes or whatever to try and get past the financial fair play. And and okay, some people might say there's a loophole here and there and they might have all um, you know, been able to follow uh, the rules without fear of ending up in court with it or any sanction. The big problem is a lot of a lot of European countries, the big countries, are, are now looking at the English Premier League and they're really worried that they cannot compete with them. Some of them will go bust if they don't get a form of revenue, whether it be a European Super League or whatever, to try and compete with them because the imbalance is so great now. Yeah, I mean, it's just it's sponsorship, isn't it? <laughs> they, they get round that by saying, oh yeah, we've just been given all this money by sponsorship. And then when the Man City case, you, you look into it and then it's a, a, some company, offshore company, who is owned by the same guy who owns Man City, you know, or who is the... the, the chairman of the board or whatever it is he's called so you look at that and that's the way they've been getting around it and, and I think Ruffy's right I don't think this is, they're the only team to be doing it um, and I think this is maybe just the first the first card to fall um, but it's they've been doing something different <coughs> to the rest of the world for, for a good few years now because they're paying these you know you know, ridiculous wages to players um, they've inflated the league they inflate how good their players are and um, you know, they, 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 everything everything about the league is, is inflated and, it, and it, it, there was always going to be a ceiling um, and you, you hope this is maybe it and you hope that things start to calm down and, and players, you know, let's be honest, getting paid 60, 70, 80,000 pound a week is still ridiculous but you'd, you'd, <coughs> you'd rather go back to that than two, three hundred thousand pound a week because it is, it's just, it's billionaires playing, um, you know, Championship manager. That's that's all they're doing. They're just they're just buying success, and um, they're buying all the best players. They're buying all the best coaches. And you know, what's your legacy if you're at Man City that you've just bought your way to titles? Yes, they play great football and they've got great players, but why? They've not brought that through their youth. They've not expanded their team. They've not expanded their brand. And Man City, Man United are still a bigger brand than Man City. Yeah. Um, so where is the money coming from? It's coming from all these sponsorship. But I don't believe they're the only club. And you hope that. You hope this is the start of it. You know, people kind of actually getting a handle on it and going. You know what? We've we've let them away f with this for so long that maybe now we need to kind of you know start actually bringing them to task. Yeah, I have no problem with the supply and demand in business economics. If you're taking in a certain amount of revenue and you bring in players who are worth their money and they get certain money because of the revenue that's being brought in, that's fine. But the whole thing is an imbalance. It's certainly you really need a whole set of really good lawyers to work out if everything is above board. Um, so Man City have got to answer questions on that, Ruffy. The other aspect of this, you know, Chelsea have got something like 30, 40 players out in loan, which again is another cheat on the system. Um, you shouldn't be allowed to have all these players and then send them out in loan. That's And the other thing about it, Ruffy, which I think is, as Richard mentioned, the, the huge imbalance in the transfer market, 
You've got guys who are absolutely mediocre footballers who are multi-millionaires. They're getting mm. paid inflated wages and they're being bought for inflated wages. You only have to look at the financial situation that Everton find themselves in. They spent £500 million on players and quite a lot of them have been woeful. Yeah, I think we, we, had a, we had a chat about it, I think it was last year, and uh, I'm, I'm just trying to get the team right here, and you, you touched on, I think it was Chelsea, they, you said the down tools for a particular manager, I can't yeah. remember who it was. Well, they did it for Mourinho. You know, now, if, you, if, you've, if you're saying, if you've got millionaires walking about a dressing room, you, that's going to happen. Because if you've, not, if you've not got hunger, yeah. if you've not got players in the dressing room who are hungry to earn and are hungry to get something, and they're all millionaires and they don't need it, you're going to get that imbalance. You're going to get, you know, three or four going, I don't know what, I'll go somewhere else and get 300. So I'm not really caring about the manager. I don't care what happens to him. And that's when, you've, if you've got the wrong dressing room, that's the things that will happen. Yeah, well, here's uh, Borja Garcia, who's uh, a sports management expert at uh, Loughborough University on the predicament that Manchester City and maybe other clubs will find themselves in. One of the things uh, which I think is important of this investigation is the ability of the Premier League to regulate the finances of the clubs. So the real, the real debate here is whether the f uh, financial fair play rules have teeth or they don't whether the Premier League can enforce its own rules or not, or if they cannot, then of course, in Britain, there is very, it is very much alive, the debate about the need for an independent regulator. Yeah, can't wait for that independent regulator who will spend, uh, you know, an eternity. How do you sift through books and, and, and say, well, you know, if suddenly an airline wants to sponsor your shirts for, uh, you know, 100 million, who are you to question? And if, that, if they think they're getting value for money, there are many ways to argue the case. Of course there are. I think what happens in, in the little bit I've read about the Man City case is the people sponsoring the club are people already connected with the club and therefore that's why they're clearly not doing it properly or they're, they're, they're using loopholes um, but it's just and the thing is they've, they've chosen Man City because they've probably been the quickest you know I know Chelsea done it under uh, Abramovich but they've kind of risen to you know prominence pretty quickly in terms of what they've won and the success they've had so they've probably just used them as the as the example but most of the clubs down there will do it because you look at you look at certain clubs and you're right roughly the, their stadiums are 30, 40, 50,000 people and they're paying guys a hundred thousand pound a week. It just doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Like they don't have the re the revenue. Like yes, now Man City probably global. You know, Man United definitely pro uh, probably one of the biggest teams, if not the biggest, behind Real Madrid in the world. So they've got. But you know, you, you're not going to go over to America or Australia or China or Japan and see someone wearing a Nottingham Forest strip. You know what I mean? Unless he's a tourist. Yeah. With all respect to Nottingham Forest and the success they've had, I just use them as an example, or Leeds United. Yeah. You're just not going to see it happening because they're not big enough globally. But yet, they, these teams are still trying to compete with the top teams and they're still dishing out £100,000, £150,000 a week. It just doesn't make sense somewhere along the line. Yeah, it would be nice actually, uh, somewhere along the line, if we could benefit from some players that are not getting a game that would come and play in our league. Although that contradicts what I say when I always want to see, I always want to see Scottish players uh, get through and play in our division. You know, but quite simply, you know, we are looking on as paupers in Scotland. We are paupers compared to their and the standard that we have. But the rest of Europe is similar to us and saying do not match yourself or try and compare what's happening down there in their league mm. to put pressure on here the biggest pressure we have is hoping that our Celtic and Rangers can somehow give a good account of themselves from August to December in the Champions League Ruffy. Yeah I think that's we all, we all look forward to that if the two of them are in there and, and even more even the the hearts and that are, if they're in the Europa we love our teams in there you love competing against the best you like testing yourself against the best and we, we hope that uh, the most of our clubs can do that because there's nothing better than talking about European football into January and February but, uh, and I think Rangers and Celtic will prove for last year you know I think they will get better and it'll be good to see who they get drawn because we w want to see them playing against Real Madrid, Barcelona, yeah. even Man City. We want to see them playing against the best teams. Yeah, um, I'm dying to know how this is all going to pan out because, I mean, if there is a penalty, if they manage to get Man City on something, uh, you know, the penalties could be quite severe. Yeah, I mean, that, but they won't be. <laughs> They'll be a fine. And, yeah. and paying, paying a club who are owned by a billionaire a fine, you know what I mean? It's like spitting into the ocean. It's pointless. Yeah. Um, 
and that's that's what it'll be. But you hope it's not. You hope it's a points deduction. I mean, I don't see the point in stripping titles because you know, I've seen someone say that you know then Liverpool would have won the league when Gerrard was there, and it's like, well, can you imagine accepting a medal like? however many years later because the team have had it stripped off them it means yeah. nothing so I don't see that a points deduction maybe um, you know the teams that go into the administration has got an all face points deduction so maybe that's the way forward but it's it's going to be a case if you're a Man City right now and I, I was working for Man City I would be going around the rest of the teams going I'm going to try and find other teams who are doing exactly what we're doing one to back up your own case but two to go right if you do it to us, you need to go and go do it to them. Because if you only do it to the one team, then the other teams are like, great, we've we've got away with it. There's one of our biggest competitors. They've been deducted points. We're we're buzzing, but because you can't, you cannot tell me that they're the only team that are doing this. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much to uh, everyone who's offered their opinion, uh, and of course, thank you to so many of you who've hit the uh, subscribe button on our channel. Thank you. We really do value your support. Um, as far as the uh, quiz answer is concerned, Ruffy, uh, you said four, mm -hmm. and uh, Richard said six. You were just one out, Richard. Seven. Ah. Oh. Aston Villa, Stephen Gerrard, Bournemouth, Scott Parker, Chelsea, Thomas Tuchel. Uh, Everton, Frank Lampard, Leeds, Jesse Marsh, Southampton, Ralph Hasenhüttl, and Wolves, Bruno Laghi. So ah, the Wolves there one. you are. The Wolves one that was the one that caught you. Yeah, I could see you going over them in your head. Yeah. Um, so it was seven <laughs> was the answer. What about the competition? It's a new one. It's a good one. Have a look at this and see if you're in with a chance. This is your chance to win one of these fantastic books that looks back at the classic shirts throughout both clubs' history. You can read about your favourite shirt and your favourite season as a Celtic or Rangers supporter. To be in with a chance of winning, all you have to do is tell us which book you would like to win in the comment section below. And to double your chances of winning, hit the subscribe button and join us on PLZ Soccer's YouTube channel. Good luck! Yeah, an absolute belter of a book either way, Rangers book, Celtic book, um, all you have to do is put in which one you would like to win. If you hit the subscribe button, doubles your chances uh, and next week we will have another competition with more prizes for you. So it's not only the channel where you'll get the breaking football news, the banter uh, and of course all the chat and opinion, uh, you get a chance to win something as well. And don't forget to download that app, it has all the breaking football news for you on PLZ Soccer in uh, Google Play and in the App Store. Great to have Richard with us and Ruffy. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow. Tam McManus will be here in the studio with us to talk more football and we'll probably look ahead to the Scottish Cup in greater detail. From everyone on PLZ Soccer's football show, thanks for watching.